And soon after, in the, towards the end of the 1950s and 1960s, we had the isolation of the first viruses causing the cold, the rhinoviruses. Ah. And then the problem was, it wasn't one virus, the rhinovirus. We discovered there were 100 types of rhinovirus. And then we discovered that there were many other different viruses, all causing this same common problem of the common cold. It is a disease that is caused by over 200 different types of viruses. The viruses give us the similar symptoms, so it's not possible to say whether it's a rhinovirus or a coronavirus or a respiratory syncytial virus. They all give us the coughs and sneezes and runny nose. I think the 1960s was the time when the viruses were being discovered and people were very excited, thinking that they would be able to develop a vaccine or some medicine. You're right, some of the centres, the big centres, have closed. And the reason is, I think, that no cure was found and people become disillusioned. They thought in the 1960s that just like polio or smallpox, we would have a vaccine or a cure. But we do not have that vaccine at present. So there was no cure. And I'm doubtful if we will ever find a single cure because it is not a single disease, it's a mixture of diseases. People have always had colds. Probably cavemen had colds. Um, runny nose and a sore throat. But they were called catars. And a catar was just a runniness. And that's what people thought it was. They used to call it a flux. Things would run, run out of your nose, run out of your mouth, your eyes. You could have a catar anywhere. Uh, we say, feed a cold and starve a fever. So people would say, you should eat a lot when you have a cold. Other people would say, no, when you have a cold, you shouldn't eat too much. But so people tried things like that. And then they tried local remedies that they swallowed. And I'm sure that everybody in the audience has a favorite treatment for their cold. None of them work. But since none of them work, they all work. that when there is no good treatment, there are a hundred treatments. Oh, it's cold. Come on, 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 Families are going to watch your documentary, and they're going to say, this guy, he, doesn't want, he just doesn't like medicine. He just, he thinks that he, his, pa his patients aren't going to like this. I've been taking these medicines my whole life, and they work. I've, I've been on the other side, and I've watched documentaries where I've said, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But the evidence is the evidence, and the doctors can't justify what they're, 
what's happening in Korea cannot be justified with the large weight of medical evidence that we have. These medicines don't work for colds. Antibiotics don't work for colds, and those are the facts. These are not things that one doctor like myself is making up. This is the large body of evidence that's throughout the medical literature across the world. And so they've done studies that have used a medicine, like a cough and cold medicine, and also a placebo. What a placebo is, is it's a medicine that looks and tastes like the regular medicine, but doesn't have any medicinal properties. And when they've done those studies and then had a group that took no medicine, they found that they got better at the same rate of time. So whether you got the medicine, the placebo, or you got no medicine, in general, all groups got better at the same amount of time. Dit is puur placebo effect als je hier beter van gaat voelen. Als je tien placebo tabletten in dezelfde vorm zou gieten, zouden ze net zo goed werken als deze medicijnen die u hier nu aan me geeft. Some watching this program might say, well, I've taken the medicines and I feel, I feel better because I've taken them. And I would answer that by, by two things. One is that they were going to get better anyway. The second thing would be is that there's a large placebo effect by taking medicines. That by taking something, your body thinks that you feel that you're doing better. And the third thing is that you've been told by advertising and by the box for so many years, for your whole life, that these medicines work that you start to believe that if the box says it works, then it's going to work. Uh, so you've been misled by the advertising for a long time. Okay, my name's Alexandra Richmond and I'm a health and beauty consumer analyst. Um, within our research we found out as well that 60% of people in the UK have suffered from a cold in the past 12 months and uh, this is one of the key reasons obviously why it's an attractive market to manufacturers doctor and that's what they prescribed for a cold oh my goodness oh, but it's like really beginning of the cold they have a oh my gosh yeah. you rattle if you jumped up and down <laughs> after taking all of those gosh it's no wonder it's such a big market then if you've got products for absolutely everything. I think here in the UK people are very much, they want convenience, they want to deal with all of their symptoms in one hit and so they wouldn't necessarily take so many separate tablets for, for a cold. That's crazy. <laughs> The biggest markets are, are markets aimed at essentially normal people. If you have a drug that's aimed toward curing an unusual illness, then they don't make as big a profit as if they can sell drugs to essentially normal people. And so there are a lot of essentially normal people who have colds, you know, two or three colds a year. If they can sell drugs, if they can convince these people that these drugs are going to cure their colds or make it significantly better, then they have an enormous market, both over-the-counter and prescription drugs. So it's in their interest to convince the public that these illnesses are dangerous that they really should be taking these drugs. Now, it's interesting that in Korea, they seem to be concentrating on the common cold. I wonder about um, the, the pharmaceutical co companies and their, their incentives. Dat er heel veel geld mee verdiend wordt, en dat is denk ik het enige belang van deze pillen, uh, dat er geld verdiend wordt. But my concern is not the, the welfare of the pharmaceutical companies, it's the con it, my concern is for my patients and the children that I treat. Because it's easy, patients feel satisfied when they leave because they have something in their hand. If I, go, if I send somebody home and say, and say, just wait a few more days and it'll get better, and I don't take the time to explain to them 
why I'm not giving them a prescription or giving them pills. They can be frustrated. So it's just much easier for their doctor to give them a prescription and say, take these four pills and you'll feel better in three or four days. They'll walk at, the family walks out and says, I got medicine, I'm going to feel better. They're going to the doctor because they want to be fixed. Um, it takes a little bit more time to explain to them that there's no magic medicine that's going to fix this illness. Um, because the patient who goes away with no medicine and gets better will realize that the next time he becomes ill with the same illness, he does not need to go and see a doctor. So he will get better on his own without seeing a doctor. So he will have learned how to look after the illness himself. The other doctor will think, ah, the other patient will say, ah, I got better because of the medicine that I got at the doctor. And so when he gets ill again, he will go and see the doctor. So it also changes the way that patients think about disease. If they always get medicines from the doctor when they go, it means that they will always come back. Mm -hmm. So it makes, uh, it makes the health service and doctors much busier if you give lots of medicine. Ik denk dat de Koreaanse patiënten uh, zich goed moeten afvragen of al die medicijnen wel nodig zijn. En dat ze aan een dokter moeten vragen wat er gebeurt als ze die medicijnen niet nemen. En heel vaak zal het dan zo zijn dat de dokter dan moet erkennen dat het zonder die medicijnen ook overgaat. After 300 yards, you have reached your destination. Okay. Ah, very interesting. <laughs> I assume this is what somebody takes each day. We wouldn't normally give an antihistamine unless the person has had the cold for more than a week. Then it would help, but if it's just been a few days, we wouldn't bother with that. And the digestant, um, no, we wouldn't bother with that. The only other point I'd make is some of these are quite strong medicines. <laughs> Verkoudheid. Verkoudheid. Ja. Dat, daar, gaat, daar gaat het over. Je herkent die dingen ook. Ja, ja, meer dan wel. Maar het is echt op zijn zinnen. Oké. Okay. Ja, ik ben echt uh, verbaasd. Maar als allerbelangrijkste dus geen antibiotica voor common cold. Want dat is echt schadelijk. Voor de patiënt, maar ook voor het ontwikkelen van resistentie. Uh, could a medicine be a problem when you're getting a cold? If it's an antibiotic, yes, we don't need antibiotics. Why it's for some for two days? Yes. So I think the interesting one on this list, which I didn't... Um, which I, I, I didn't say, is um, the antibiotic. So, in fact, in different countries, between 40 and 60 percent of people who have a cold are given an, an antibiotic. And there really isn't evidence that it makes people get better more quickly. And actually, there have been studies to show that people actually come back to the doctor more often if they've been given an antibiotic because they have complications like a rash or diarrhea which has resulted from inappropriate antibiotic use.